Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Josh and you're watching Our History. Today we're going over the life of Kratoa, who served as a translator for the Verenigde Oostendienste Company, or the VOC, during the establishment of the Cape Colony. So if you enjoy this, please be sure to like, and if you're new here, consider smashing the subscribe button. If this isn't your first rodeo and you haven't shown some love to that subscribe, now is your opportunity. Thank you very much for watching. Kratoa Kratoa, also known as Eva, was a remarkable figure in the South African history. She served as a translator for the Verenigde Oostendienste Company, or the VOC, during the establishment of the Cape Colony. Her name appeared in the journals of the VOC as early as 1652, making her one of the most well-documented women of her time in South Africa. She was the first woman to be mentioned by her coin name in European records of the settlement of Cape Town. Kratoa's contributions as a translator were significant. She facilitated communication between the European colonizers and the indigenous Khoi people. Her story sheds light on the complex interactions between the different cultures during this period. Her name The name Kratoa is believed to be Dutch adaptation of Kololoros, which is the Kuku Gowab designation. It is thought to be the name referred to her being placed under the guardianship of either her uncle Ochumato or Jan van Riebeck or Maria de la Quelleri. The exact birth name of Kratoa remains unknown. This information suggests that Kratoa's name was originally Krotoa, but rather a Dutch spelling of her Kukukwawab designation. Biography Early Life Kratoa was born in 1643 and belonged to the Strandloper people. She began working in the household of Jan van Riebeck, the first governor of the Cape Colony, at the age of 12. During her teenage years, she learned Dutch and Portuguese and became an interpreter for the Dutch settlers, facilitating trade negotiations. Kratoa received various goods for her services, including tobacco, brandy, beads and copper. She was expected to bring back cattle, horses, pearls, amber, tusks and hides when visiting her family. Unlike her uncle, she achieved a higher position within the Dutch hierarchy, serving as a trading agent, ambassador and peace negotiator during times of war. Her story showcases how the Dutch newcomers initially relied heavily on the natives for accurate knowledge about the local population. This dependency was crucial as she was able to offer fairly dependable information, aiding the Dutch in their understanding of the inhabitants. The arrival of the Dutch in April 1652 was not initially seen as negative by the Khoi people. Some saw the Dutch as a chance to benefit as middlemen in the livestock trade, while others viewed them as a potential allies against the existing foes. Krotoa believed that the Dutch presence could be advantageous for both parties. Krotoa's arrival in Jan van Riebeck's household has multiple accounts, but there is no concrete evidence of her forceful kidnapping as a child. It is widely believed that she was taken in as companion and servant for Jan van Riebeck's family. Some authors and historians speculate that she may have endured a sexually abusive environment based on the fondness shown to her by van Riebeck in his journals. Circumstantial evidence suggests that Krotoa lived with her uncle Auchomato, known as Harry to the Dutch, and showed hostility towards the Strandloper people, possibly due to her association with them. Krotoa's destiny and fortunes were closely tied to her uncle and his clan. The Strandloper people were a sedentary, non-pastoral hunter-gatherer clan who were believed to have had an early contact with the Dutch people. Ochumato, a member of this clan, is known to have served as a postal agent for passing ships of various countries prior to the arrival of the Dutch. There is a theory suggesting that Krotoa lived with her uncle, which would imply that her transition to serving the Dutch East India Company may not have been as violent as previously thought. Willem Barentsen Villiant, a chaplain and sick healer, and his wife were believed to have experienced the birth of their first baby around the same time as a virulent disease spread rapidly in the settlement. This event played a significant role in the initiating negotiations with a local girl for her services. Ochumato, who had a history of working with Europeans, was likely approached by the Dutch East India Company for these negotiations. It is speculated that Ochumato may have offered his niece for servitude in order to improve his relationship with the VOC. Baptism and Marriage 
On the 3rd of May 1662, Kratoa was baptized in the church inside the Fort de Goede Wip by a visiting minister named Pietrus Sibelius. The baptism was witnessed by Rulof de Man and Peter van der Steyl. On the 26th of April 1664, she married a Danish surgeon named Peter Havgard, also known as Peter van Mierhof by the Dutch. After the marriage, she became known as Eva van Mierhof. This marriage marked the first instance of a Khoi Khoi person marrying according to Christian customs. The wedding was celebrated with a small gathering in the house of Zacharias Wagenaar. In May 1665, the van Mierhof family left the Cape and relocated to Robben Island, with van Mierhof assuming the role of superintendent. However, in 1666, they briefly returned to the mainland after Eva gave birth to their third child in order to perform the baby's baptism. Tragically, van Mierhof's life was cut short during an expedition on the 27th of February 1668 in Madagascar, where he was murdered. After the passing of her spouse, a new governor named Zacharias Wagenaar was appointed. Contrary to his predecessor, Wagenaar harbored strong prejudices against the Khoi people. Given the stability of the Dutch settlement at that time, he no longer regarded Eva's role as a translator as necessary. Consequently, Eva's services were no longer deemed valuable, leading to her dismissal from her position. Later years in exile. After returning to the mainland with her three children on September 1668, her struggle with alcoholism led her to leave the castle and be with her family in their crawls. However, in February 1669, she was unjustly imprisoned for immoral behavior at the castle and subsequently banished to Robben Island. This was likely due to the strict anti-alcohol laws enforced by the Dutch East India Company in the region. Despite attempts to return to the mainland, Krotoa was repeatedly found herself banished to Robben Island. In May 1673, she was allowed to baptize a child on the mainland, but her life remained tumultuous. Krotoa died on the 29th of July, 1674, and was initially buried at the castle in the fort. However, her remains were later moved to an unmarked grave around a hundred years later. Legacy Peter Nella and Salomon, two of Eva's youngest children from her marriage to Van Mierhof, were taken to Mauritius in 1677. Later, Peter Nella, also known as Peter Nella Mierhof or Peter Nella van de Kaap, married Daniel Zagman, a VOC vegetable farmer from Flitsengen. They had a total of eight children, including one named Eva. In 1706, the family moved back to the Cape. Their granddaughter, Engele Katrina Zagman, married Abraham Peltzer Jr., the son of Abraham Peltzer Sr., a VOC soldier from Hamburg, Germany, and Elizabeth van der Berg. Krotoa's descendants, including the Peltzers, the Kriers, the Steenkamps, and other Afrikaner families, form a part of South Africa's diverse heritage. For nearly 250 years after her death, Krotoa's story remained largely unexplored. The focus of attention in South Africa history was primarily on the white European women who came as missionaries to the country. It was not until 1920s that Krotoa's story started to become a part of South African history. In 2016, on the 350th anniversary of the castle, a ceremony was conducted by Krotoa's descendants to return her spirit to the castle in the fort. Furthermore, on the 20th of May 2023, Stellenbosch University renamed the R.W. Willocks building to Krotoa as part of their commitment to inclusivity. Cultural References a Lander, a novel by Dan Slay, originally written in Afrikaans and translated by Andre Brink, delves into the intriguing lives of Krotoa and her daughter Peternella. Told from the perspective of seven different men who were acquainted with them, the book provides a multifaceted exploration of their experiences and relationships. It offers readers a unique insight into the lives of these historical figures. Eva was being used in South Africa as a warning against miscegenation or interracial marriage or relationships as late as 1983. In 1990, Karen Press, a South African poet and author, wrote a poem titled Krotoa's Story. This poem aimed to reimagine the life of Krotoa 
the historical figure by exploring her emotions and conflicting desires from her perspective. The poem was based on an earlier children's story called Krotoa, initially created as an education initiative by the South African Council for Higher Education. Its purpose was to provide school children with indigenous South Africans' perspective on colonization. In 1995, Antoinette Pinar, the South African performer, debuted her one-woman play called Krotoa. The play premiered at the Little Karoo National Arts Festival and was honored with the Heri Award. What sets Krotoa apart is its portrayal of Krotoa as a mother figure for the nation, a perspective that had been previously dismissed by white South Africans. In 2000, Delian Mattia authored the novel Pieternella van de Kaap. This work was meticulously researched, drawing from various sources such as diaries, documents and archives. Mattia also sought consultation from renowned experts in the field, including Drs. Dan Slay and Helena Scheffler. The novel aims to shed light on the lives of Eva Krotoa and Pieternella van Meerhof. In her 2005 essay, Malitzen, Pocahontas and Krotoa, Indigenous Women and Myth Models of the Atlantic World, Professor Pamela Scully compares the lives of Krotoa, Maletzen, and Procahontas. Despite being born in different regions during the same time period, Scully argues that these women had similar experiences in the colonist system. She suggests that Krotoa's life emphasizes the importance of indigenous women in the establishment of the Atlantic world. Additionally, Scully highlights the universal mistreatment of indigenous people in emerging colonial systems and the flattening of the experiences in the colonial origin narratives. If you enjoy this channel and you would like to support more content like this, because all contributions are greatly appreciated, please check out the Patreon link in the description below.